May 16th, 2005. I have a sponsor. I do have a home group. My home group is called Haven at Last. We meet in Bethesda, Maryland on Thursday nights uh, at 7.30. I am uh, I'm extremely grateful to be here. Thank you, Paige, um, and the Came to Believe group for having me out. I, uh, you know, I, I, this place, North Carolina, the Raleigh area in general, just has a special place in my heart. I've met a lot of people, good people down here over the years that I've been sober and have had an opportunity to come down here on uh, many occasions and spend time with a lot of you and meet a lot of you. So when I come down here, I'm always grateful. When I get offered to, to come down here, I'm always grateful that I get to do that. Uh, I was thinking, I was thinking a couple of things, but before the meeting, we went out in the hall and, and, and Paige said a little prayer with, with, with us in a circle and I was overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude. And that doesn't always happen. But tonight, for some reason, I was overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude for the relationships that I've been able to forge in Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not know that I wanted that when I got sober. I did not know that that was possible. And every now and then, I get a little glimpse of it. And I think tonight, I just had that feeling. I don't know if it was because I had a long drive down here, kind of by myself with a lot of time to think. And, you know, those fears kind of well up a little bit. I had a guy I met in the bathroom tonight. Uh, he said, you, you nervous? Yeah, I, was like, oh, I, guess, you know, I guess a little bit. Always a, probably a good thing to be a little nervous to care about Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I got here, I, I met up with some, some people who, who came over here at the Starbucks and just walked up into a group of alcoholics. And everybody was laughing and talking and telling stories and having fun. And uh, it's just not – I just – it's not what I thought. So if you're new tonight and you're not sure what, what AA can – can bring to your life if you're not, not sure why you're here if you're still thinking maybe you got another you know another shot out there and <laughs> you know maybe you do I don't know but I didn't and uh, I'm glad I stayed and it's 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 created these relationships with people and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later so but tonight I'm going to do my best to just share with you all what I was like what happened and what I'm like now and I wanted to I wanted to start out by by, I was thinking on the way down here that yesterday I got asked though, in my in my industry, my, my work industry, there's a lot of coaches. I don't know if anybody else is in the industry where there's like coaches, you know, people who coach. And, uh, and I I got asked by a guy in my who's in my industry, is a friend of mine, if I would join this podcast that he was on to talk about the industry and, and success and everything. And, and uh, and I got on and I quickly realized that the other guy on there was a coach, you know, and he was like a serious coach. And, uh, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, followers on Instagram and all this stuff. And he came at me and he's, he's got that energy, that coach energy, you know, and he's, he's talking about money. And he's like, you know, tell me about all the success, all this stuff. And, and, and it, it's funny that I don't feel very comfortable in that setting. And I, I, I think partially it's because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we, we really try to get up to podiums like this. And again, if you're new, and I'm not, and not uh, brag about our sobriety and brag about all the stuff that I've got and everything great that's happened to me in my life. And, and not that any of that stuff is bad, but that podcast yesterday is, is I hope, going to be a lot different from what I try to do tonight. I'm going to try to just share my experience with you tonight. And at the end of the podcast, the, the, the coach, he said, I want to thank you for, for coming on here and, and seemingly getting out of your comfort zone. I think he could tell that I did not feel comfortable in that setting, you know, and, uh, and I feel a lot more comfortable here with you all in our boss. So uh, I grew up not, I actually grew up less than a mile from where I live right now. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that. You know, you just, every now and then I'm like, I have not gone very far. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess that's probably a good thing today. Uh, and I, I grew up in a, a, large, a large Irish Catholic family filled with alcoholism, <clears throat> mental illness, you name it. You name it, we had it. You know, you name a medication, somebody was taking it. You name a drink, somebody loved it. You know, and, uh, and my, some of my earliest memories were 
holiday parties with uh, the uncle who, who having a grandma seizure on the floor because he decided to stop drinking two days before Christmas, you know, and, uh, and my, you know, my aunts and uncles and the, their cheeks getting red and their eyes getting glassed over and they start getting louder and they're telling more stories and they're laughing, those belly laughs and me and my cousins are, you know, trying to get 20 bucks off whoever we can, you know, and, uh, and then I remember driving home with my father and we're driving on the left side of the double yellow line. That is not the right way, to, you know, we should be driving home. And, uh, and those are some of my earliest memories. And my mom, you know, uh, having, these, having these panic attacks and going to the hospital and, and medicine and all this stuff. And, and I guess I just say all that to say if you're, if you're a scientist, you believe in anything that has to do with genetics. I was not winning the genetic lottery <laughs> as a kid. And, um, but I, I, I had friends and I, I did pretty well in school at first. And, and at some point, Along the way, I, I hear a lot of people in A say they felt uncomfortable or they just felt like their skin didn't fit. One of my favorites is I felt like everybody got the life manual and I didn't get it. And I don't know if I necessarily felt uncomfortable, but I always know, I, I know today that I always and still can be a very competitive person. I always wanted to win. If I wasn't first, you know, the old Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last, right? <laughs> And I, I always kind of subscribe to that in my own mind. I don't think anybody else really cared, but I really cared if I was the best or not. If I wasn't the best, I didn't want to be there. If I wasn't the best on the team, I didn't want to play on the team. If I wasn't going out with the prettiest girl, I don't want to go out with any of the girls. If I wasn't my teacher's favorite, I hated the teacher. You know, whatever it was, I, I was always in competition, sadly, most of the time with myself. And at some point along the line, I went from being that kid who got good grades, that kid who played sports and had a lot of friends, and the kind of guy that your family would have been totally fine with if you said you were sleeping over my house, you were going out with me to hang out. And, and I went from being that guy to being the guy that you were definitely not telling your family that you were hanging out with me anymore. And, um, I, I, I like to say I discovered alcohol at the age of 16 years old, and I was, which maybe in here might be young, it might be old, I don't know. I think we all, you know, everybody starts when they start. And, and I had already fallen off the, I guess, the path before that and started doing some other stuff and skipping class and hanging out with the wrong crowd, smoking cigarettes and, you know, cussing a lot more and doing all these things that, you know, my family definitely didn't want me to do. But at the age of 16, a few things happened. The first thing was the home that I grew up in burned to the ground. And it burned to the ground due to my and my brother's actions. We were, uh, we loved to hang out in the basement and smoke some different things. And, uh, <laughs> and we liked to light candles, you know, and into the pretense that it was going to make that smell of the, the things we were smoking go away. <laughs> I don't know why we're, we're always thinking that. But uh, one night we, we decided to, you know, light some candles and, and we left for school the next day uh, and we left those candles lit. And when we came back from school, those candles uh, had caught a drape that, that was uh, hanging on over an open window, and that drape had burned the house down. And I, I say that to say that I ended up having to move farther away from my high school at the time, and that did not prove to be a good thing for me at that age. I was, I was, my mom let me take her car because I needed to get to school, and I did not go to school anymore. I was like, wow, that was cool, you know. I got the car and let's hang out, let's party. And I was one of those guys, I know a lot of people, you know, probably had some success here through high school, maybe even into college, maybe grad school, maybe there's a lawyer, doctor in here, I don't know. I, I was not on that track. I was very quickly uh, on my path to dropping out of high school. And my mom and dad were divorced at the time and my mom, you know, God bless her, she loved to date alcoholics. I don't know what that was. <laughs> but every guy, she, including my father, you know, uh, were, were alcoholics. And she was dating this guy at the time, and we called him Jesus. Uh, because he looked just like Jesus, you know. Except, <laughs> except, this, except he drove a 1970-something Chevy pickup truck. It was nice, man. It was a nice truck. You know, we were young and teenagers, and we thought this truck was just the coolest thing, you know. And... Jesus would come home and, uh, and we'd look outside and the whole side of his truck would just be smashed in, you know. We'd be like, Jesus, what happened to your truck? And, you know, like, this is the most valuable thing I've ever seen. And he'd be like, I don't know. You know? And, uh, 
time I didn't know what he meant by that, but when I was shortly thereafter come to find out Jesus was suffering from blackouts. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't remembering, he was hitting stuff with his truck. And, uh, and one night he came back to the house and he had a couple of fifths of absolute vodka. I'll never forget it. And it was a discovery for me that night. I got drunk for the first time. Uh, a few a few other things happened that I really try to re- remember today when I can. The first was I got real sick that night. I got so sick, I was throwing up everywhere. And to this day, I will do anything other than throw up. I've never been somebody who enjoys it. People are always like, do it, you, you feel better. I'm like, I don't want to go through it in the first place. You know? <laughs> I, I got so sick that night. I remember laying on the bathroom floor, hugging the toilet, and putting my face on the tile. You know, it was the only cool place. And, you know, right next to the, the bottom of the toilet. If you're a guy, you know what I'm talking about. You, you don't want to put your face right there. And, and the, the, the second thing that happened was is I said a prayer. I said the first of many what I call foxhole prayers. And this was one of those prayers that I'm sure everybody here, or most of you is probably familiar with, you fired up there. You know, you're like, hey, what's the worst that can happen, right? You know, and my prayer was a very innocent prayer. It was, God, if you make this feeling go away, I promise I'll never drink again. I mean, first time drinking, I'm lying to God already. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, of course, woke up the next day and the feeling was gone. And, and later that afternoon, I remember we were hanging out and somebody's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, you got any more of that alcohol around? And it, it, it got me and it got me quick. And I proceeded to chase that, that feeling, that excitement that I had uh, for, you know, for, for some years after that. And, I was very quickly put into treat, to put into outpatient treatment centers. I was very quickly to see psychologists and drug therapists and told that I shouldn't drink and I already was showing <coughs> symptoms of alcoholism. I went to my first inpatient treatment center at the age of 17 years old. And, and by then, I, as I mentioned, I was already suffering from blackouts. Blackouts were, uh, I, was, I was placed on a ton of medication that, that I really didn't need to be on, but I was on because you know, I was I dropped out of high school and nothing good was going on in my life and I was depressed and I was anxious and it was probably from all those those other uppers and things I was doing, but but uh, the doctors didn't know that. And so I found myself blacking out a lot and, and the blackouts were were funny at first. They were the kind of thing that you may laugh about the next day with some friends, the kind of thing that if, if somebody told a story about the next day, you'd feel like you know you were cool and people liked you and then they just started to shift and went from, man, you were funny last night. And it started to turn into things like, do you remember what you said last night to me? Or do you remember how you treated her last night? Or, uh, you know, you said, you said my car last night. <laughs> Where's my car? Whatever it is, it just, they started to get worse and worse and worse. And, and uh, I remember in the first treatment center I was in, people would bring meetings in, you know, uh, panel meetings, and they would talk about their about alcoholism and stuff like that and everybody would go around and they would say my name's so and so I'm an alcoholic my name's so and so I'm an alcoholic and it would get to me and all the other patients would be like come on John like you can do it you know and I would just be like nope I didn't want to admit it because I knew it's funny I didn't know what alcoholism was but I knew instinctively that if I said I was an alcoholic I was basically admitting that I cannot drink or I shouldn't drink and so I refused to say it and just continued on that path and and the trouble got worse and worse for me. I got, you know, at the age of 18, I found myself getting arrested from a, for the first time as an adult, one of, one of many times for a DWI. That would be a, a theme throughout my drinking, was drinking and driving. And not like the drinking and driving, like some people talk about, like I, I, I go to the bar and I, you know, I didn't want to call an Uber. I'm talking like I would drink and drive. Like, you know, I, no reason to drive, but. We're going somewhere. Where are we going? I don't know where we're going. You know, throw the 30 pack in the back and let's roll, you know, and uh, dangerous kind of stuff. And at the age of 18, I got pulled over uh, and proceeded to punch the arresting officer in the face. I don't recommend that. And uh, found myself in jail a lot worse off than the officer was. And, uh, and it was the first time I really faced trouble. It was the first time that it seemed clear that maybe I had a problem with drinking. And it was the first time that I was sent to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous through another treatment center. And I would go to those meetings and I would listen to you all, share your stories. And I felt I heard some hope in your stories. I'd get a sponsor, maybe my name. I'd stick around for a month or two. And then I would just leave. 
And I would do that. Oh, I proceeded to do that for about four years over and over. I would come in. I would go out. I would come in. I would go out. And I never really got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd come to the meetings. Uh, and, and what would happen is somebody, usually my sponsor, would give me some sort of suggestion. And that suggestion would go against what I thought was right. And I would say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then I wouldn't do it. And I never did any of the steps. I never really gave this thing a chance. And so I would just literally come, come to some meetings and leave, come to some meetings and leave. And at the age of 19, I got my second DWI. At the age of 20, I got my third DWI. And at the, uh, so again, I was a real bad blackout drinker by this point. I was driving, so I was working 60 miles away from where I lived and I would drive home in blackouts from work. And I don't recommend that. I'm, it's actually one of the things I'm most, the most ashamed about today. And, and, and one of the things that got me into AA was wondering how many times I could do that before I just ran somebody off the road or, or uh, ran to the back of a cop doing radar on the side of the highway one night, you know? And uh, I, I would work this job and I got my last, you know, hopefully my last DWI down in a place called Charles County, Maryland, Waldorf, Maryland, and I was working this job, and one night it was snowing real hard, and I, uh, I left work, and there was a girl, I worked in a mall, by the way, I worked in a mall, I loved a mall when I was younger, the mall was such a great place, and, uh, just endless possibilities, and, uh, and I met this girl at the mall, <laughs> And uh, she invited me back to her mom's place, you know, but you got to remember, I'm, I'm the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde that our literature talks about. I'm the nice guy at the mall, but the fifth of vodka starts going down, and I start turning into a different person. And I get angry, I'm getting belligerent, I'm like my family, my cheeks start getting red, the eyes start glassing over, and they're having fun, and I'm looking to punch somebody in the face, you know, and, uh, and I get to this girl's house, and her mom very quickly, I'm pretty sure, realized there was something wrong with me. And I think I made it about 10 minutes, and she was like, you got to go. You got to get out, and don't ever come back to our house. And I left there, and by this point, it had been snowing. It, probably, it was probably a foot of snow on the ground, you know, and I lived 60 miles away, keep in mind. And so I get in my car, and I start driving, and I black out. And I come to, I come to, and I'm, I'm, there's a knock on the window. You know the knock I'm talking about. Right? Not a knock I'm going to hear. And, uh, and I look over, and there's a police officer. And he's got his flashlight, and he sticks it in the window. And I had realized I had fallen, I had smashed into a, a snow embankment with my car. And the car was still running, and my foot was still on the gas. And I was just kind of, just, you know, just revving the engine, you know. And somebody called the cops. And uh, this cop, He's like, roll down the window. And I roll down the window. He's like, son, you've been drinking tonight? And I was, no. I mean, of course, I'm, no, I have not. I'm driving. Why would I be drinking, right? <laughs> and he, just, he didn't even say anything. He just aimed the flashlight down. And I looked down on my lap, and there's an empty fifth of vodka sitting oh. on my lap. You know? And I, I pick up this fifth of vodka. And this is, again, where the belligerence comes. And I look at him, and I go, you've been drinking tonight? And I kind of mock <laughs> what the insults <laughs> I found myself arrested again. Uh, it, gets, it gets real lonely for those of, for those of you here who, who know what it's like to get arrested over and over again and have to make those promises to those people who have to bail you out. It gets real lonely when they don't want to bail you out anymore. And shortly after that, I, I I'll describe the end of my drinking. It was I wish it was more exciting. I was working a a dead-end labor type job. I had three DWIs. I couldn't drive anymore. My license was revoked. I was living rent-free at my father's house. The only bill I had was a $10 Nokia phone that I played Snake on, if anybody remembers. <laughs> and I worked this job. I worked 50, 60 hours a week and in the heat all day, digging holes, you know, working around nasty stuff. And every Friday, I'd get paid. And by this point, I was on that list that banks have. If you know the list I'm talking about, you, you overdrafted a lot, basically. And I would 
take my check to a bank and they'd be like, we don't want your money, Mr. Mm-hmm. Kennedy. We don't want that, you know? And so I would have to go to the check cashing place which is a terrible place for alcoholics, right? It's like, it's almost like working at a restaurant, but you only work one day a week. You know, you don't get to replenish that cash every night. And so I get paid on Friday, and by Monday I'd be broke. And I'd have to get through the rest of the week just, you know, bumming money off people, bumming cigarettes, stealing money where I could. And uh, it's funny, when I got sober, I wanted to, I didn't understand why I wanted to kill myself every day. And looking back after some time and kind of hearing other people share their stories and then sharing my story with my sponsor, it became very clear that alcohol had become my master. I was working 60 hours a week out in the heat, and I would take that check and I'd give every dollar to alcohol. Every dollar. And if, I, if that's not having a master, I don't know what is. You know? And what ended up happening to me is I, I was a... And I was a, a daily drinker, but I was also a, uh, a spree drinker. I, I was a binge drinker. I, I found myself on a four-day binge, and I got arrested again. Surprise, surprise, I punched another police officer. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the belligerence and violence just kept getting worse, and I kept getting lower and lower. And I found myself in jail for 30 days. And I sat in jail, and there wasn't a person left for me to call. There was nobody who could bail me out. And I'll tell you, it's a real lonely place to be in if you're anything like me, you start doing what we do best. You start making some promises to yourself. You start swearing off alcohol. You start talking about changes you're going to make and how this is never going to happen again. And it's going to be completely different this time. And that's what I started to do. 32 days later, they released me from jail. And I found myself at my probation officer uh, officer's office. And she... She said, congratulations, John, you violated probation, and I'm sending you back to jail. And I walked out of her office, and I had this thought come over me, and the thought was, man, I'm feeling on edge right now, and and I know exactly what will take that edge off. But it's not a fit, because a fifth always sends me in jail. But you know what never put me back in jail? One of those little miniature airplane-sized bottles and bottles. I don't know why. I I thought, if I just drink one of those, it'll just going to smooth the edges just enough for me to be able to breathe and go home and rethink what I got to do next. And I went to the liquor store and I got that miniature and I walked out of there. And it's funny, there's a, a story in our book about a guy named Jim, I believe. And Jim talks about uh, his idea, his brilliant idea was whiskey in milk. And, <laughs> and my idea was a miniature vodka. And I remember walking out of that liquor store and I had this quick thought that I shoved away quickly. And it was like, this is a good idea. But I shoved that thought away real fast. And uh, there's another liquor store about a mile up the road from there, and I bought a fifth that night. And, um, and I went on what I would consider my last run of drinking, and that lasted several months. And, and in the end, nothing, nothing fancy happened. I didn't have a white light moment. I, I ran into a guy who was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I mentioned, I've been going out of AA for, uh, for four years. And this guy in particular was somebody who two and a half years prior to that time had called me up and said, John, I got two DWIs in three days. I don't know what to do. And I was like a, I was like a promoter for Alcoholics Anonymous, but I wasn't in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was like, not anybody else was like that. I was like, I know just the place for you to go. And I took him to an AA meeting. And I, I brought him to the meeting. I introduced him to all of you. And, you know, you think about it. It'd be like if one of the retreads you guys have here came into a meeting one night with somebody else and was like, He's, this guy needs a lot of help, you know. And, I, and we left the meeting that night. And he, I, I, I'll never forget it because I, I still to this day feel a little bit bad about what happened after the meeting. We went back to his house after the meeting and I said, so what would you think? As I was pulling out a bottle of Jack Daniels out of the bottle. <laughs> And I said, do you like the meeting? I'm going to screw the top. And he was like, you know, John? He said, I think I'm going to give this thing a shot. I felt something in that meeting tonight. And I don't want to drink anymore. And I was just thinking, you know what you should have thought? I should have thought, man, that's great. I'm real happy for you. But the only thought I had was, that's double the whiskey for me tonight. And I, and I left his house, and I didn't see him again for two and a half years. And when I ran into him two and a half years later, he was dressed kind of how I'm dressed right now. Keep in mind, he was hanging out with me. He was a loser. I mean, this guy was bottom of the barrel drunk, you know, had nothing going for him. He was dressed up nice. He had a good job. But more importantly, he had a smile on his face, and he had some color back in his face. And he said, hey, John, how's it going? I was like, you know, I had to fake it. I was like, hey, it's going great, you know. And he was like, 
remember that A meeting you took me to two and a half years ago? And I was like, yeah. He was like, I've been going back every day ever since. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I was like, I'll be damned. And he proceeded to tell me all the great things happening in his life. And then he turned it on me and he said, how have you been? And I, of course, lied through my teeth. I was like, I'm doing great, man. Life is good. Everything's going well. Mind you, I'm sleeping on my grandfather's living room floor. I'm working that same dead-end job, and I'm spending every penny I make on alcohol at that point again, and I want to die. And luckily, for some reason, because I don't know if I would have did the same thing that he did, he did something different. He, he, Because I've, I've seen a lot of people over the years who I met in Alcoholics Anonymous, who I saw from the AA, outside of AA. And if I ask them how they're doing, a lot of them will probably lie like I did and say things are good. And I might just say, well, it's good to see you, man. You know where we are if you're interested. And for some reason, this guy looked me dead in the eye and he said, after I told him how I was doing, he said, really? You look like you're dying. And I think about that moment a lot. Because if he had said, well, it's great to see you, John. I'll see you around. I don't know if I'd be here tonight. And he said, you look like you're dying. And do you want to go to a meeting about Cost Anonymous tonight? I will come pick you up. And for some reason, amidst all my ego and pride, because I was somewhat offended. I mean, who says that to somebody, you know, and, uh, who saved their life like I saved his? You know? <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, I was dying on the inside. I was dying. And I said, okay. I said, okay. And I don't know why that night was different, but I went to the meeting, and, and something, something changed for me. I... Uh, I mentioned going in and out of A for many years, and, and where I got sober, there was a large, it was a large group. We had about 250 members in our home group, and there was a lot of Johns, and so they gave me the nickname 24-Hour John, and they called me that because I, oh, you guys don't do it here, but we, we do these little chips up where, where I'm from. We give out little chips, and uh, they have a chip that they give everybody who's 24 hours sober, and I picked up a lot of them over the years, and so they nicknamed me 24-Hour John. <laughs> And it's funny, they still call me that. <laughs> they call me that when I walk up. And uh, I'll tell you, I say that to say that over the years, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, John, you're 24 hours, John, right? And you've got some years sober. I can't stop drinking. What do I do? What was it that finally changed for you that got you sober this time? And I always think and wish that there was some magical thing that I could say, come over here, don't tell anybody. Let me whisper it in your ear, and I'm going to tell you the secret. And the truth is, when I, when I look back on that first night, that first meeting, and even beyond that till today, the biggest difference was I was just willing. I was willing to do something different. And it wasn't out of any virtue. It wasn't because I, I had all of a sudden figured out the, the secret to life or that I needed to be honest or that I should probably be a good person. It was none of those things. It was simply that I had run out of ideas on how to fix my life. That was it. And our literature talks about being hopeless, you know, and I was hopeless, finally. And if you're new tonight or if you're, you're coming back again and you're feeling hopeless and you're wondering how you're going to make it, that's a good place to be, at least in my experience it was. Because people started suggesting things to me that very night. And usually where I would say okay and maybe take the idea in and then only do it if I thought I, I should, I just started doing it. I started doing these things. And the first thing somebody said to me was, you know, you should probably get a sponsor. And I said, okay. And, and I got a sponsor that next day. He was somebody who I had seen around the rooms of AA for, for years and was, was somebody I wanted what he had. You know? and, I, and I said... I asked him to be my sponsor, and he said, you got nothing going on. You should go to meetings as much as you can, every day, actually. And I said, okay. And he said, we're going to read the book, and we're going to do the steps. And I said, okay. And he said, you're going to write this inventory. And I said, okay. And it just went on and on like that. And he said, you're going to get service at your home group. You're going to get service at some of these other groups you're attending. And I said, okay. And he said, we do things outside of the meeting about Calls Anonymous. We fellowship. Up, up where I got sober, we did a lot of different weekend retreats, and we would do, uh, you know, skiing trips and whitewater rafting trips. We did all kinds of stuff. And I, mind you, I was somebody who needed a drink to, to be around you and have any sense of comfort in my own skin. 
And so the, the invitations to these things for years prior to me getting sober, I would always say, yeah, sure, I'll be there. And I just wouldn't show up or I'd get drunk. And I started saying, okay, and I started doing those things. And I got sober at a young age. I was 22 years old when I got sober. And I was a child. I was a child. I was 22. I was an, Legally, I was an adult. But I can tell you right now, I had no idea how to live like an adult. I spent my adult years stealing from the people who loved me and trusted me, including my mother, my father, my little brother. Some of my, my last drinking memories are stealing my father's medication. He had degenerative arthritis and stealing the last pill out of his, his bottle so, he, so, it would give me, you know, so I could get some sort of relief and watch him sit there in pain. Some of my last memories are, you know, my father had gotten ill and lost his company that he had and was living off a of disability and really had nothing. And I'd steal the last $20 out of his wallet that he needed to eat dinner, you know. And that was the kind of guy I was when I came into AA. I did not know how to live. And it was through AA and through that sponsor and through you all sharing your experience that I learned how to, how to be a person in society. And I, and I think about that. I was thinking tonight when I, when I just was filled with gratitude for being here and having friends here and knowing so many people here that I didn't want any of that when I got sober. I was, I was so determined to just get out of trouble because, you see, I was about to go back to jail. I was sleeping on my grandfather's living room floor, which was a very uncomfortable place. I didn't even have like an air mat. Forget an air mattress. I'm sleeping on the floor, you know, and uh, I didn't have a license. I was working this job with this guy who drank in the truck. We used to drink together every day in the truck, and I couldn't stand that anymore. And I didn't know what to do. And little by little, the actions in Alcoholics Anonymous and the suggestions from people like you, I found a different job. I started to learn how to do things like, I mean, I, I, this is embarrassing to say, but I didn't even know how to grocery shop. I didn't even know how to do laundry, really. And I learned how to be an adult, a man in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started working through the steps, and I found myself doing this inventory, and I had some stuff on my, my fourth step that I, I didn't want to write down. I, I had done some stuff. I had had some stuff happen when I was younger. I'd done some weird stuff when I was drinking. I was never going to look another man in the eye and tell him those things that I had done. And, but in the end, when I did my fifth step, I was honest with that sponsor. Again, I think I was just hopeless, and I didn't know what else to do. So I was completely willing to do that thing that I never thought I was capable of. And I found myself uh, – Right in this eighth step, and I want to talk about that because it was, a, it was just an important part of my recovery on my path to finding a higher power. Because when I got sober, I, I don't come from a very religious background. I don't come from a family that went to church. They talked about God sometimes, but the idea of God to me was, was an idea of weakness. I, I equated God to almost like a Santa Claus type figure, you know, and uh, that, that – uh, what we call Bush League, that pinch hitter, right? That, that prayer that I would throw up there and, and maybe in a pinch God could help me out. And I started to, I started to work the steps. And I got to this eighth step and, and through this fourth step I had written and fifth step I had discussed with my, fons- my sponsor, it was very clear that I had done a lot of damage. And most of the damage had been done with my family. My mom, my dad, and my younger brother. And this was a younger brother who I would steal his money. I would steal his clothes. I punched holes in his door. He was only a year and a half younger than me, and I was the only example he had in his life. And I was a terrible example. And here I am. I get sober, and I, I, I do this, this A-step list, and my sponsor starts suggesting me to, to try to start being a brother again and, and being a son. And I call my brother, and he just won't answer his phone. He won't take my calls. He doesn't want to talk to me. And, and over time... Uh, I was able to build relationships with my brother, with my mother, with my father. And I, I want to tell st- – I'll very quickly tell just the story of, of kind of what really made me believe that there was something out there bigger than me. My father was somebody who I didn't want anything to do with. And I – you know. A lot of people in there will say things like their father – you know, and, I, and, and this is true. A lot of people's fathers, they weren't the best. I had a father who, although he was an alcoholic and – you know, had his issues, he was a good guy, and he loved me to death, and he really wanted to help me, and when I was around him, he would say nice things about me, and he would root for me, and I hated him for it, I hated him, I just, 
didn't want to be around them because I hated myself. And what ended up happening is I was able to start spending time with him. And over that time, we became friends. And we, we became friends to the point where I was able to call him when I need, when I, not when I needed something, but when I needed somebody to talk to. And I was able to share the joys of my life with him. And that was not something I ever wanted. And I say all that to say that when I eventually did sit down with him after working with my sponsor and I was able to you know, start paying him back the money, something shifted inside of me. And what shifted was this idea that, that I, was I was going to be taken care of. And that came from a place of I came into AA and was unable to stay sober. I was unable to write these relationships. I was unable to have relationships with people. And now I had had a relationship with this man that I hated. And because of that, I felt like there was a higher power. And I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know how that happened. But I know that I was unable to accomplish that on my own. And my younger brother, somebody who, again, didn't want anything to do with me, wouldn't take my phone calls, eventually became somebody who called me when he needed help. And he's had his own struggles over the years. And I've been able to be there for him and be an example of what this program can do. And today, we talk all the time. I talked to him today. He invited me to something next week. And I'm grateful for that relationship. My mother, I didn't want anything to do with her either. She, so my father ended up passing away and my mother ended up getting sick with cancer shortly after that. And I was able to be a part of her life and help her until she passed away. And I, I just know that if it was not for AA, I would not have been able to do that. And I don't, I don't think that, you know, I think normal people, non-alcoholic people all over the world are helping their family all day. But I was incapable of doing that because I was unable to show up financially, morally, in any way to support my family. And I don't, you know, I was thinking, I don't, I don't normally talk about this, but I, I was thinking about it because that podcast I was on, I, I, I am a high school dropout. I am a high school dropout. I dropped out of high school when I turned 16 years old. And I got my GED when I was 18 years old. And when I got sober, I never thought I would, I would find a path in life. And through AA, like I said, and through people here, I, through the examples I had here, I was able to find a career. And I was able to find some sort of success in life. And I don't normally, I don't know why I don't normally talk about that, but when I look back on it now today, it is truly amazing. And it is nothing that I was capable of doing without Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and after I got sober a couple years in, I was given the opportunity to start a business, a company. And that company has grown and grown and grown. And I have been able to, again, be somewhat of an example to all these people around me enough to where they want to work with me. And I don't know what that is. I, I, I don't know how I get here other than AA, other than the steps, other than the principles that I've learned in these rooms and from a sponsor. And I, uh, when I had about a year sober, my sponsor gave me a suggestion. He said, you know, there's a treatment center that, that he took a meeting into, and he said, there's an opening on Wednesday night. There's this spot, and, and uh, they could use somebody like you in there. And I remember telling him no at the time. I was like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and I'll tell you why. I had a good reason at the time. <laughs> at the time, I told him no because I'd already had a commitment that night, and I liked that commitment. And that commitment was with some friends of mine, and we got dinner, and we, we went to the meeting, we set up the meeting, and so it, was, it wasn't like I was, you know, it was, it was not a bad thing, but my sponsor said, at the time, he said one of my favorite lines, he said, I said, I don't know, and he said, that's fine, do whatever you want. And that was like, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever heard that, that was sponsor talk, but you should probably do this thing. <laughs> and so I started taking a meeting into that treatment center, and I, I want to talk about that because... Again, when I got sober, I didn't realize that helping other alcoholics was going to be so beneficial to my life and helping not only to keep me sober, but to just give me that joy of seeing other people's success. And I started taking meet, that meeting in there and I started meeting a bunch of different guys and I was able to start sponsoring and helping uh, a lot of guys through there. And I did that for... About 15, 15 years I took that meeting in there. And I have still to this day, I mean today, yesterday I had lunch with a guy who I met in that treatment center 17 years ago. And today he, uh, 
He's been sober 17 years. And, and we had lunch yesterday and he was catching me up on his three young daughters that he's had since he got sober and his family that he has today. And when I got sober, I never would have thought I wanted that. I never would have wanted to be a part of that. And it's those kind of things today that have been uh, the joys and, and have been so impactful in my sobriety. So I think a lot today about what my job is here in Alcoholics Anonymous now. And it's to show up and say yes. Keep it simple. I've got great examples. Some in this room of, of people who I talk to and I can still try to complicate things a lot today. I, I was talking to my sponsor the other day about, about, uh, about something I was unsure of and, and the message was just very simple, man. Just, just keep it simple. There's no need to get all, I, I like to get up here. You know, I like to think I'm smart. I like to think I know, these, know the answers to everything. And the more simple I've kept it, and the more I've just tried to stick to putting one foot in front of the other and showing up and trying to be useful and, uh, and not living the way I used to live, my life has continued to get better. And it's continued to grow, and I've continued to be able to enjoy experiences like coming down here to North Carolina with, and spending time with people that I care about. So I think, uh, I think that's, that's enough out of me. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here, and I appreciate y'all listening. <laughs>